Finally, God can be immediately known and experienced. You know, Mr. Zindler has never denied this. And I want to close by mentioning that point. There are probably a lot of people here tonight who are, who are seeking for the meaning to their life and existence. I want to encourage you to go home tonight to think about what we've had to say and ask yourself, could it really be true? Could there really exist a God who loves me and cares enough about me that he would take on human form in Christ to die for me and to, to bring me into fellowship with him? I wasn't raised in a, in a church-going family, but as a teenager, I heard this message for the first time, and it revolutionized my life. I would just encourage you, if you feel that this could be something that might be true, uh, that you would also make this exploration yourself. Begin to read the New Testament and ask yourself, could this message be true? I think you'll find it could change your life just as it changed mine. I would uh, say, listening to Dr. Craig uh, repeat uh, uh, my evolution article uh, argument and my, my uh, uh, evil argument, and try to convert those to a proof of God, that what he has unwittingly done is proven the existence of a devil. Because those things I'm talking about are describing an evil being, not a perfectly good being. Uh, a being that creates us over all these billions of years with all the living and dying and bloodshed of nature, red and tooth and claw, that is the description of a devil, if this is indeed the result of a conscious agent. In fact, of course, we know that evolution proceeds unconsciously. There is no motivator of it. It is completely uh, without intelligence. But if it were the result of intelligence, how would we have to indict that deity? What wickedness would we have to ascribe to it for the evils that we see in nature to say nothing of the evils that we see within our own kind? He asks for a cause of the universe and thinks that he has given one. He thinks that by saying in the beginning, God, we have answered something. Actually, we've only created another question. We have asked, how did God get there? And if God can exist for eternity, then why not the universe? At least we can detect the universe. We cannot detect God. Although he does say we can detect God, that we can feel God internally. Now, I have to resist mightily the, the temptation to go to the ad hominem abusive species here. But I have to tell you quite candidly that the mental hospitals of the world are filled with people to whom God speaks daily and sometimes all night long. We have to question the sanity of a person who quite sincerely, not speaking metaphorically, says that God has spoken to him or her. This is not usually considered a sign of mental health. And so this internal speaking from God is something that we must be very suspicious about. We cannot a priori rule it out that in some case that might be so. But certainly the general uh, effect of our observations and those of us who have worked in mental hospitals at one time or another have seen this, uh, we must be very careful about that argument. With regard to God causing the universe, we have a problem. The universe is everything that exists. And if God is the cause of it, God is outside the universe. And that is a contradiction. There cannot be anything outside the universe. God, uh, the universe is all there is. Now, where did it all come from? Well, the evidence is not all in. The physicists had a very serious blow struck to them last week with the um, uh, demise of the super collider, which might have been able to answer some very fundamental questions in cosmolo cosmology. On the other hand, there was some interesting information from uh, the astronomers. They discovery that our galaxy, is, um, our galaxy is much heavier than it was thought to be, that there seems to be at least 10 times as much mass 
in our galaxy and is swallowing up the large Magellanic Cloud, and that this has some very important implications in cosmology, uh, namely it might mean that the universe is closed. The idea is that since the Big Bang, the universe has been expanding, and we've generally thought that it was just going to go on expanding forever until we die in the heat death. On the other hand, some people have thought that it might collapse back on itself uh, and disappear, and some thought that it might collapse on itself and bounce back. Now, we don't have enough information to really know one way or the other. But an interesting thing is that in quantum physics, there is a principle where things can come out of nothing. So-called virtual particle pairs do continuously come into existence only to annihilate each other. And the idea is being seriously developed by astronomers and cosmologists that the universe itself originated as a quantum fluctuation out of literally nothing and will exist for a while and go back into nothingness at some time, just like the virtual particles. I'd like to end with a quotation from the Gospel of John, the uh, appended last chapter 21, verse 25. And there are also many other errors which Christians have believed, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Why don't we offer a round of applause to uh, both gentlemen. Okay, before you have an opportunity to cast your ballot on who you believe presented the most compelling evidence this evening, now that you've heard the main body of the debate, as we were discussing how it is that we wanted to proceed tonight, we asked um, uh, uh, Rob how he felt the evening should go, and he would, said he would like to have five minutes in order to talk about his response and his perspective on this issue. And so uh, we said we'd be glad to do that as long as we can then have our representative offer his response uh, and his perspective on what he's heard, and uh, Rob said that's only fair. And so that's what we're going to do before we uh, get around to the voting going to give uh, Rob an opportunity to take five minutes and to discuss whatever he would like to discuss in relation to this issue and uh, the evidence that he's heard on both sides tonight. He will be then followed by Mark Middleberg, our evangelism director, uh, who will also speak for five minutes, uh, at which time we'll begin the voting. Thank you, Lee. Atheism versus Christianity. Where does the evidence point? Well, I sure am glad that we have this issue resolved. Atheists and Christians have a difference of opinion on whether or not there is a God. We have a difference of opinion on whether or not Jesus was who your Bible claims that he was. Both sides feel that their evidence is compelling. Our differences of opinion regarding the evidence for God or Jesus does not, however, make one side any more or less moral than the other side. Our differences do not mean that one side has better values than the other side. We merely disagree on whether or not the evidence is sufficient to compel someone to believe in God or Jesus. Unfortunately, many people don't understand that our differences are limited to whether the theological evidence points to atheism or Christianity. Because of this misunderstanding, discrimination against atheists is pervasive in our nation. Many people think that if you are an atheist, then you are immoral. In fact, atheists are the leaders in our country when it comes to morality. Atheists do things right not because some make-believe deity parent will punish us if we are bad, but rather because doing things right is the good and decent way to live. Many people think that if you are an atheist, then you are evil. Atheists are good people. We just happen to think that God is make-believe. Many civic organizations have a policy of no felons or atheists allowed. 
whenever the government editorializes a